Time now for Morning Rounds with CBS News Chief Medical Correspondent Dr. John LaPook and CBS News contributor Dr. Holly Phillips. First up, chemotherapy is standard for most breast cancer patients, but a study out this week finds some of them don't need it. Here's John with more. In 2010, Anne Louise Popolo was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer, the kind fueled by estrogen. Her tumor was analyzed using a genetic test that can help predict recurrence. Results showed she was at low risk, so doctors treated her with hormone-blocking therapy alone, sparing her the side effects from what's usually also given, chemotherapy. Why do that if it wasn't going to give me a different outcome than I would get for not having the chemotherapy? So it made sense to me to opt out of it. The study in the New England Journal of Medicine followed 1,600 women with hormone-driven breast cancer and a low risk score. They received hormone-blocking therapy, but no chemo. After five years, less than 1% had their cancer recur in a distant part of the body. Breast cancer specialists say this provides the clearest proof of the accuracy of a test that's been used for more than a decade. Oncologist Dr. Harold Burstein of the Dana-Farber Cancer Center treated Popolo. It allows the doctor to sit up a little straighter in the chair and look the patient in the eye and say, you know what, it really looks like you have a good prognosis and that chemotherapy is not going to improve that prognosis. So what's next for researchers, John? Well, it's about more and more personalized medicine. And it turns out that if you have 100 women who have breast cancer and you analyze their cancers, you take biopsies, Genetically, in terms of the proteins that are expressed in the surface, they may, they may be completely different, every single one of them. And you may want to wow. be able to tailor the treatment specifically and differently uh, depending upon the genetic profile. Then after that, over time, these tumors can then mutate again. Yeah. So maybe that what's effective on day one isn't effective five, six, seven months later. Then you rebiopsy it, look at the genetic profile again, and then change your game plan. So the tumor's mutating, your game plan changes, and then this is this idea of chronic cancer, that it's not just one treatment, you can evolve over time, and then people can go much longer. Well, next up, more than 22 million Americans suffer from asthma. That's number been, that number rather has been on the rise for decades. A new study may shed some light on a possible factor that might surprise people. I always assumed this increase was because of environmental variables. Is that it? Sure. Well, you know what? Even our bodies in some way are part of the environment. Now, this was a, a very interesting part of what's an ongoing Canadian study uh, where researchers are looking at children from birth to the age of five and looking at possible risk factors for asthma and allergies, which are sort of thought to be along the same kind of medical continuum. What they found was that for children, a group of children who were considered at very high risk of developing asthma based on their early symptoms, when they were three months old, they had lower levels of four specific bacteria in their intestines. Then the researchers took it a step further and followed this up with studies in mice, and they found by giving mice these four bacteria, they were able to lessen the severity of some of these symptoms. Now, in no way was this a cause and effect study. We can't say having too little of, uh, back, of these specific bacteria causes asthma, but it is a really compelling connection to follow up on. Oh, that's interesting. So, John, how might bacteria in the gut right. affect this risk of asthma? Right. And I just to follow up on Vanita, yes, there are things in our environment. People talk about the clean hypothesis. It's too clean now, and that's yeah, one yeah. reason. But in terms of the bacteria and asthma, one way is that we have these trillions of bacteria in our gut. When we eat food, they eat the food and they make chemicals. Yeah. And some of the chemicals these, these are hypotheses, but some of the chemicals they make may be absorbed into the bloodstream and they're anti-inflammatory. So they go to the lung and they decrease inflammation in the lung. Mm -hmm. And then there's interaction between the different types of species. There are thousands probably of different species of bacteria and the way they interact can affect your immune system. If you lower the immune system in the body, your risk of wheezing may go down and if you raise it, it may go up. But is there a way to identify what is the biggest reason for the increase? Is it the bacteria? Is it the environment? Do they know yet? Uh, well, there are, we are changing our microbiome. These are the trillions of, of bacteria that are in our, our gut. And if there is a relationship between these bacteria and the risk of asthma, and we're changing these bacteria, yes, it may be that, for example, by giving antibiotics, we know for sure we change the right. gut bacteria that yeah. way. But there are other things that are less obvious. For example, the rise in C-sections. When a baby is delivered through the birth canal, the baby picks up the bacteria that are there from the right. woman. Uh -huh. If they go through the skin, it's a different set of bacteria. So there may be all these different wow, factors, yeah, that are they're playing. Wow. Um, 
Holly, we've been talking a lot about gut bacteria lately. Why is it so important? You know, this is a huge area of focus. Um, you know, when we think about it, there are, of course, trillions of bacteria that live in our body in a very symbiotic relationship. In fact, there are 10 times as many bacterial cells as human cells in our body. Uh, and the bacteria don't just sit there. They're active participants in everything that happens in our body. They affect our digestion. Uh, we know they help to both absorb and produce certain vitamins, vitamin B, vitamin K, for example. They play a role in possibly uh, causing or preventing certain cancers, heart disease, uh, and our mental health, that's an area of extreme focus. Uh, we know that bacteria can help to produce neurotransmitters that affect our mood and ultimately our mental health. Even uh, obesity. And even obesity, role, absolutely. So keeping everything in it, these bacteria in good balance really should be um, kind of at the forefront of our thinking and research. After hearing so much about the bacteria, I have added more yogurt to my diet because you always hear that's the good bacteria, but right? But you never yeah, know. Yeah. That's where the research is now. We don't know which bacteria. It's like saying right. take antibiotics. Which antibiotics? Right, yeah. Which yeah. probiotics? Right. Which prebiotics, a lot of research there. Finally, parents struggle to get their kids to eat vegetables. Researchers at Texas A&M University stumbled on a little fact that might help. They analyzed leftovers from more than 8,500 students. They found vegetables paired with more popular items like burgers or chicken nuggets were more likely to be thrown out. The researchers say choosing the right pairings could improve veggie consumption and keep the green beans and broccoli out of the trash. Of course. In, in my parents just didn't put anything else on the plate but the vegetables and then there was no other option. Right, and there's great science behind that. You know, even and we can't just blame the kids for choosing cheeseburgers and pizza over vegetables. Yeah. Adults themselves, there's been some studies to show the best way to get adults to eat vegetables is to give no options. Just put the vegetables on right. the plate and there you go. And there's the, then there's the Sid LaPook technique. My 97 year old father now, but when we were kids, my yep. sister Nancy refused to eat her lima beans. Right. He said, the next thing you're going to eat is those lima beans. Put them in the refrigerator. That was the next thing she ate. I did this recently. I only offered fish and Brussels sprouts. Saint had nowhere to run. <laughs> he was like, what else can I do? Short of leaving home, that's about it. <laughs> Dr. John LaPook, Dr. Holly Phillips, thanks so much for being with us this morning.